All right. Hi, Professor. Thank you so much for taking the time to speak with me today about how Europe underdeveloped Africa, Walter Rodney's kind of magnum opus, in my opinion. Uh, if you could just introduce yourself, you know, say a few things about you. Yeah. Uh, well, thank you. Thank you, Aisha, for the invitation to be with you uh, this afternoon for this conversation. My name is Professor Zayu, uh, and I'm on faculty at Georgetown uh, University. Um, and uh, I'm a historian of Africa and the African diaspora, uh, but really a specialist of West African political history, African nationalism and liberation movements. Uh, and so this work that you asked me to talk about is one of my absolute favorite works uh, in in history um, and in African studies and African affairs, really. Yeah. So I look forward to this conversation. And before we start, I wanted you to add, just talk a little bit about kind of your relationship to Rodney's work and how his work has maybe informed your perspective as a historian. Yeah, so uh, so so I was first introduced to this work, How Europe Underdeveloped Africa, as an undergraduate at Morehouse College. And uh, and and while aspects of it were, were over uh my head when I when I first engaged with it, I've continued to read it over the past uh, two or so decades, um, and and I think every time I engage with it, uh, you know, uh, there's even more insight that I think I gain from from this work. You know, I was reflecting on this conversation uh, yesterday, um, and and really, I think it's 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 the most important book written maybe in the past 50 years to really help us understand Africa and the dynamics between Africa and the rest of the world. And I know that that, that can sound a bit dramatic, um, but I think when you when you think about, about, about some works that really help to frame the conversation, it's not that, that it's the last word or the only important word, but it's as far as a work that sort of frames our understanding of 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 how Europe and Africa have interacted over the past four or five centuries, I don't think you get a more important work. And so I consistently rely upon this work, both for my own research, for my own analytical framework, and for my own teaching, right, to really help students understand the poles and the dynamics that exist uh, between Europe and Africa, and even within Africa itself. Absolutely, and thank you for that. And just for the audience to contextualize, uh, the professor was my personal professor at Georgetown, uh, where he taught history of Africa too, right? Yes, yes. <laughs> history of Africa too, which covers uh, the colonial period up until now. Yes. Uh, and so, yeah, I thought that it would be fun if we could do a little you know, quiz, because he was my professor, you know, I'm kind of getting my lick back here, you know, seeing <laughs> the turns, the, the tables have turned in a way. And so just really quick, we're going to see how fast you can do this as well, because, okay. because it's a, there's a 10 minute timer here. So if you can get it in less, we're going to have a little quiz on the 54 African countries. And are you ready to begin? Okay. Sure, sure. <laughs> all right. Starting now, you can just tell me and I'll write them in. Oh, on, on uh, all of them. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So uh, we got Egypt up here. Uh, we, have, uh, uh, we have Tunisia, we have Libya. Um, we have um, Morocco, Western Sahara, um, Burkina Faso, not me, not me <laughs> um, uh, Nigeria, Mali. Oh, see, so you just got Niger because of that. <laughs> oh, yes. Um, <laughs> uh, we have Guinea, uh, Sierra Leone, obviously Liberia, okay. Senegal, um, uh, Ivory Coast, Cote d'Ivoire, Ghana, Togo, Benin, Cameroon. Uh, um, what do we have? Uh, Chad here. Um, then we have uh, uh, Sudan and South Sudan, mm -hmm. um, the Democratic Republic of Congo. We have the Congo, a Republic of the Congo, uh, Republic of the Congo. Um, we have uh, Gabon. Um, we have Central African Republic, uh, Ethiopia, um, and then Kenya, Uganda, Ru Rwanda, and Burundi. Uh, Eritrea, uh, not Eritrea, uh, Somalia. Uh, yeah, then Eritrea. Um, all right, um, down here we have Angola, Namibia, obviously South Africa. Um, Mozambique. These are the most challenging. Yeah. This is not my region. <laughs> Mozambique. Uh, Zimbabwe, um, Malawi, Malawi, uh, which Zambia? Oh, is it Zambia here? 
Ah, I got remember wrong, okay? Um, Tanzania. Well, technically you got it right. You don't have to know where they are. Just <laughs> that thing. Oh, is. oh, okay. Yeah. Um, uh, I have Malawi. Wow, oh my God, why am I? Uh, I got Zimbabwe. Oh, Malawi. Well, obviously, let's do uh, uh, Madagascar. I did Tunisia. Um, Algeria. I can't believe I've got Al Algeria. <laughs> The Algerians are going to be in the comments, man. Yes, I know. Um, <laughs> deep in, uh, I guess, what did I forget? Uh, uh, Guinea Bissau. Um, this is pretty good. It's not even uh, half the time, and you only have 12 left. Okay. Oh, uh, who, who am I missing? Um, oh, well, uh, Lesotho and Swaziland. Mm -hmm. um, uh, I said Eritrea, I said Somalia. Uh, oh, uh, 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 Equatorial Guinea. Mm -hmm. Malawi. Who else am I missing? Rwanda. The way I'm trying to figure it out as well, I'm like, hmm. um, central southern country. Mark Algeria, Liberty, Egypt. I got Burkina Faso, Niger. Um, oh, oh, wow. Yes, these are. <laughs> <laughs> wow. wow. Um, I said Malawi. There's, okay. There's the one inside Senegal, though. Oh, Gambia. Okay, so I'm missing Gambia, obviously. So, so there's Gambia. Okay, so. Uh, oh, wait, they want me to, okay, they want me to do uh, a Cape, Cape Bird. Um, yeah. Okay, okay, they want me to do Cape Bird. Um, what's, what's the other one off the coast? Uh, uh, Seychelles, they want me to do uh, Seychelles. Uh, uh, mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. Seychelles, um, I'm looking, why am I? <laughs> this North African country. Um, why am I? Okay. Zambia, Zimbabwe, Angola, Namibia. Um, There's also this funny sounding one next to Eritrea, here, in the white above Ethiopia. That's being neglected. <laughs> oh, Djibouti. How am I forgetting Djibouti? I'm forgetting Djibouti. Yes. Okay, so Djibouti. Uh, Only five more. Oh my gosh. <laughs> um. Yeah, but now, oh, what's, what's off the coast? Oh, I can't even see what's off the coast. Of, uh, uh, is it South, South Tome and Principe? Mm -hmm. Yeah, South Tome and Principe. Uh, oh, the last one. <laughs> well, it's, it's the too big that I'm, that I'm looking for. And there's another island, though. You see the circle under the Seychelles, I believe. Yeah. Oh, wait, did I not say Zanzibar? Zanzibar's not independent. Zanzibar's not, 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 <laughs> not independent. I don't think, I don't think, yeah, yeah. No, uh, uh, oh, wait. So after the Seychelles, um, <laughs> that's so funny. And it all, uh, yeah, I don't know that I'm gonna, I'm just upset about, what am I for <laughs> under okay. I know, I know one that you don't have, but I don't know what this is in Central South Africa. I'm not gonna lie. I shouldn't, I should actually, this is embarrassing. I should know this. If, uh, it, gets, if it gets to one minute, I'm, I'm putting in my, uh, <laughs> You better not be looking at a map over there. <laughs> yeah, that's, that, I can't believe I forgot that. I'm, I'm very embarrassed. Um, it's Botswana. Um, yes, oh. I did I did look at the map. What? Um, <laughs> and Mauritania, Botswana, Mauritania. Oh, Mauritius. Oh my gosh, this is cheating. Mauritius, Mauritius. Okay, but to be fit, wait, there's one left. There's, which one is, which, where is it? Where's the circle missing? That's a good question. Oh, oh Comoros? Oh, uh, yeah. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Okay, we got. Well, I mean, okay, the last five. Bots, I don't know Bots, what you can say. Botswana. I can't believe I've got Botswana. <laughs> oh. You know, the, the funny thing about forgetting Botswana is I was just hanging out with some people from Botswana. Really? I was in South Africa and I was hanging out with people from Botswana. And yeah. so now I feel bad that I forgot about Botswana. Anyway, well, thank you so much for playing my game. And uh, now we can just head right into the discussion. Sure of Rodney's work. And, sure. you know, I think it makes sense to start with pre-colonial times uh, as Rodney does in the work. And I kind of wanted you to set the stage for what kind of governmental structures and perhaps what kinds of education existed in the pre-colonial period. Because Rodney talks extensively about the difference between governmental structures that existed in pre-colonial Africa and governmental structures which existed in Europe at the same time. He discusses how Europe is kind of on this pathway exiting feudalism, going towards capitalism, whereas many African societies from his description are entering into the feudal stage from communalism. So if you could talk to us a little bit about the governmental structures and perhaps any specific examples of pre-colonial African governments. Yeah, well, well, so I want to do this, I, I, but I want to frame frame a little bit more about the book before before getting into it. So, so I want to say a couple of things. So, so Walter Rodney 
is Guyanese. A Guyanese, a historian, goes to uh, school uh, uh, at the University of London, uh, and he writes his first book uh, entitled A History of the Upper Guinea Coast, uh, which is a history of West Africa from 1545 to 1800. Mm -hmm. He comes back during the period of, of independence at the invitation of the then president of Tanzania, Julius Nyerere, and Julius Nyerere invites him to witness the process of decolonization happening in Tanzania. And so he's teaching at the University of Dar es Salaam in the late 1960s, early 1970s, and chooses to write this book while in the African continent, while working and observing the process of decolonization that Julius and Aniere is uh, leading. So, so I just start off by saying is that, you know, this book is very much so produced by Africans and from the African continent. And it's based in an African perspective of the world and of and of world history. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and, and one of the things that, that Rodney does is he is he writes about how there's this relationship between, you know, the African present and the African past. And, and in fact, he begins, he says, you know, this book is really about the African present, but we cannot understand the African present without understanding the African past. And so this really gets to your point in your in your question uh, I want to say say one other thing Walter Rodney uh, after he writes the book he moves to Guyana and leads the political movement in Guyana where he lives until he's assassinated in 1980 um uh and so Walter Rodney uh, is one of the many African heroes that that I think we end up losing now 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 to your question um about um um how he begins with sort of pre-colonial Africa. Well, what Walter Rodney is trying to show in this uh, discussion, right, is that African people, peoples, African polities, African societies had their own forms of governance prior to the arrival of Europeans. And at some levels, this may seem like a very basic statement, but it's not because so much of African history uh, has been contested because African people have been assumed to have not had anything prior to their interactions with Europeans. And what Walter Rodney is saying is that actually, no, there were a variety of, of type of types of political organizations in Africa. There were the more traditional ones in terms of kingdoms. There were several kingdoms in pre-colonial Africa. There was the kingdom of great Zimbabwe in modern day uh, Zimbabwe. And we found that the, this kingdom in fact traded as far as China. And so there are artifacts from the kingdom of great Zimbabwe that made their way to 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 parts of Asia. Uh, obviously we know about, uh, you know, the ancient uh, e Egyptians, but but even uh, up, up, even up beyond then, we have the ancient kingdoms of of Kush, of Nubia, uh, ancient Ethiopia. Uh, we have the various Swahili city states uh, established along the Indian Ocean, and they had relationships across the Indian Ocean with Indians, with people in the Arabian up 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 peninsula within West Africa. We had the great empires of Mali, of Songhai. Um, um, and 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 of Ghana, we have the Aksum king, kingdom. We have the Oyo kingdom uh, in in uh, Nigeria. We had the ancient kingdom of the Congo, which was incorporated into parts of modern day Angola, modern day Congo, modern day uh, uh, Gabon. And so, so across the African continent, there were there were many formal, large, centralized territories known as kingdoms, but that wasn't the only form of governance structure that existed. There were also a number of village city-states, right, in which the primary political un unit came down to the village a community, right, a handful of people, a handful of families who organized their lives, who organized uh, their days who had sets of rules, sometimes written down, sometimes uh, uh, known and practiced orally. Uh, and that was consistent throughout um, the African uh, society as well. And in other instances, like in the instance of, of sort of where part of where most of my research focuses on in uh, a, a Liberia, some of the, the sort of the, the uh, 
indigenous polities that existed there included uh, confederacies in which uh, village states would come together uh, in times of war or in times of economic exchange to work together, to participate. Uh, and then, of course, uh, after that sort of peak moment or, or crisis, they would return to their uh, autonomous, uh, autonomous selves. And so so I think what, what, what Walter Rodney is trying to show overall is the general diversity that existed on the African continent. And I think a part of what he's really trying to show is that that diversity existed because most pre-colonial African societies establish forms of governance based upon their need, mm -hmm. based upon what was what they thought was necessary for them. But it wasn't sort of monolithic or unanimous across the board, and they interfaced with one another at varying levels as well. Yeah, and so a bit further on in terms of the question of development, and a comparative view between the kind of varying governmental structures that existed in Africa and that existed in Europe. Rodney says that when two societies kind of come together and one of them is at a greater stage of development or a more advanced stage of development, it will be to the detriment of the one that is at a lesser stage of development. And so I kind of wanted to put the question to you, whether or not when we're comparing levels of development during the pre-colonial time, whether or not we could say that Africa as a whole was less developed than Europe at the same time. Yeah, so that's a that's a really good question. And I think to, to, to sort of understand the question, we have to go back to how Rodney defines development. And Rodney defines uh, development as the capacity to master your environment and take care of yourself, right? That's all it is, is can you grow enough food to feed your people and develop the technology to take care of yourselves and defend yourself? And so from that position, most of the African continent in the pre-colonial era was developing. Mm -hmm. But the thing that, that that the interaction with Europe introduces ends up being sort of what is the purpose of mastering control over the environment? Do you master control over the environment uh, so that you can conquer more people, especially more people in distant places? Or do you master control over the environment so that you can sustain yourself? And so I think that at pre-colonial times, um, I think... Uh, you know, we can say that many parts of Africa, uh, you know, were on a sort of a much uh, quicker pace of sort of a development, mostly because it was on organic African terms. It's not to say that there were no conflicts. There were. It's not to say that 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 there were no war wars. There uh, there certainly were, but but that the overwhelming situation was not Africa's subjectivity to people and territories outside of itself, but it was an organic process uh, of development. Um, uh, and I think that, you know, um, in some regards, uh, I think that Africans had exerted mastery over their space and time uh, in ways that Europe wouldn't see for several centuries. I mean, again, we have, to, we have to we have to think about this that 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 Europe Europe conceives of the Dark Ages at the height of the Islamic and the African world. And Rodney gives a specific example to that point where he says that you know there were public baths in the Maghreb at a time where some Europeans still thought that it was perhaps even unhealthy or dangerous to to bathe. So, I mean, I mean, we take we take even 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 the country that you come from, right? Senegal and Mali and and much of what is known as the Islamic West Africa um, had a great mosque in which people would travel from the Arabian Peninsula, would travel from from Egypt, would, would travel from from Spain to study under under African Muslim clerics, right? We're talking in the in the eighth century of the Common Era, in the ninth century, in the tenth century. We have the great uh, mosque at 
at Timbuktu, um, you know, uh, which was which was a global learning center. Uh, and so I think it sort of represents another example of sort of this level of advancement taking place in Africa when, you know, there are other dynamics elsewhere. Yeah, and on the topic of kind of the relationships that African countries, or Af not countries at this point, not nation states the way that we know them today, but perhaps sure. different African polities had amongst each other. Could you talk a little bit about intra-African relationships in the pre-colonial times in the sense of how much did different African states, like the Mali Empire, for example, know about African states that were you know, in Southern Africa, on the East, the connections perhaps between the Egyptian empire and others. Was there a great deal of, for example, trade, trade routes, um, just kind of intellectual exchange of information? What was the connection between African polities in the pre-colonial period? Yeah, so that's a that's a really another really good question. You're 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 full of great questions, which is why you're one of my favorite. Thank you. Favorite students. Um, so so in terms of, of thinking about connections, I think we should think about them in two ways. One, uh, in terms of the migratory patterns, right? Um, so 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 many central and sub-Saharan African peoples um were a part of several different strands of migrations from the Bantu uh, migration. So happening over about uh, a couple thousand years, we have people moving from both East, East Africa and 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 uh and Southeast uh, Nigeria, modern day Southeast uh, Nigeria uh, 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 today and populating much of the rest of the African continent. We call this migration the Bantu migration. And the Bantu uh, migration represents the exchange, the movement, of these groups of African people and also their ideas. This represents one of the key things that connects the African continent. Key ideas, languages, in fact, the overwhelming majority of languages uh, uh, that are spoken across Sub-Saharan Africa have these similar linguistic uh, roots connected to these migratory patterns, uh, and so and so uh, and so so even after the Bantu um, a, a migration, there continued to be movement throughout and across the African continent. Um, uh, one of the key places we see this uh, is, for example, through the Trans-Saharan trade. Right, so uh, the three uh, great empires of the savanna that we referenced earlier. Uh, Ghana, Mali, and Songhai sort of all represent empires that gain control over the Trans-Saharan trade. But their control over the Trans-Saharan trade wasn't limited just to the movement of goods northward across the Sahara. But they also controlled the strategic routes in West Africa and, and at times in Central Africa, right, that brought goods to the key city states like Gao. And so in my view, this represents not just a control of, of, of what is above them, but also what is below them. And these, these routes, both to the north of the Sahara and to the south of the Sahara, are key cultural, key intellectual, key uh religious and social uh forms of exchange that's that, that's happening on the on on the African continent. So so I sell that to say that um across the African continent uh for for many centuries Africans were interacting with one another and they were exchanging with one another. This is just as a quick example. This is why in terms of African cosmology uh and African uh um um theology even there's so much similarity because similar groups of African people develop similar ideas about how the world worked, about how the cosmos worked, how God worked, how families should be structured. And I think that's sort of evidence of their of their interaction. Yeah. And I think that, you know, it would be kind of remiss of us to not discuss one of the hot button topics about pre-colonial Africa, which is the role of slavery in African societies. Uh, oftentimes, you know, some perhaps bourgeois historians 
<laughs> will use uh, the example of the fact that slavery existed in African societies prior to the arrival of the Europeans to kind of justify and downplay the impact that the transatlantic slave trade had on African societies. And so I wanted to ask if you could talk a little bit about the nature and the characteristics of slavery, its role in different African societies and its differences between the transatlantic slave trade or perhaps European slavery. Well, this is, this is really good. This is, this is one of the key questions, that, as you noted, uh, Aisha, uh, in terms of, of sort of, you know, understanding pre-colonial Africa. And what I will say is we first need to recognize that while slavery as a domestic institution existed in Africa, it existed all across the world as well. And so Africa was not unique in terms of the institution of slavery. But what was unique about many forms of African slavery, and again, this isn't uh, you know blanket for everywhere, but, but generally speaking, um, slavery within the African context was much more akin to servitude. Mm -hmm. Many people were enslaved uh, because of debts that they owed. They were enslaved maybe uh, if they went to war against a rival nation and lost. Uh, but we have these instances in which some people were enslaved as day laborers in which they would have to go and work on someone else's farm for the whole day. And then after they were free to go back to their family, to go back to their village, and then would be expected to, to sort of later return. And so one of the chief characteristics I think about African domestic slavery prior to the Atlantic slave trade was I think its flexibility and that it did not emphasize the uh, lack of humanity in the same way that the transatlantic slave trade would, would sort of later play. Now, now it's true that many of the first people that were tied up into the transatlantic slave trade were those who were domestic slaves in Africa. But the thing to keep in mind in, in terms of this very important question um, is, that, is that the Atlantic slave trade was driven by Europe. We have a letter from the 15th century in which uh, the kingdom, which the king of the kingdom of the Congo writes to the king of Portugal. And, and in this letter, he says, we want to trade with you, but we don't want to trade with you in slaves. But yet every day your men are coming here, they're grabbing our people, they're taking slaves. And what we know, and this is at the beginning of the slave trade. So what we know is that the Portuguese, the Spanish, the Dutch, the French, the English, later the Americans are driving the slave trade, especially as they conquer more and more territories in the Americas. And the central aspect of the Atlantic slave trade ends up being dehumanization, mm -hmm. tying these people, pulling these people away from their land, pulling these people away from their families, and just sort of this near total force and brutality, which represents a new dynamic, I would argue, in world history, um, in which people who are enslaved are reduced to objects. And that change, that reduction to objects, I think represents one of the main thing that distinguishes uh, the Atlantic slave trade and slavery in the Americas from the domestic conditions of, of slavery in Africa, that, 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 that in Africa, many enslaved people were still able to withhold their humanity. Being a slave did not mean you were no longer human. Uh, but in the Atlantic slave trade context, it did, in fact, mean that. Yeah. And could you discuss a little about the kind of impetus, I suppose, of European slavery, what prompted European nations at that time to search for such vast quantities of labor outside of the continent of Europe? Yeah, so so we cannot understand the rise, the dramatic rise of the Atlantic slave trade without understanding the conquest of the Americas. North, South, the Caribbean. Europe frames 
their arrival in the Americas as a discovery. And we know that, th that this language is problematic. But what's useful about this is that, is that, is that, is that what Europe does discover in their minds is all of this land that will help them expand beyond the borders of Europe. We have to remember that prior to the age of discovery, Europe is just modernizing. This goes back to, to one of the issues that you raised very early, that, that the modern day nation states are just now emerging, that Ferdinand and Isabella are able to consolidate their power and create Spain, right? Uh, so, 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 so now that that there's there's the actual territorial control of Spain, and and then they come across all of this land, what they then call New Spain, right? That there's a there's there's this desire in their minds, there's this need, right, to toil the land, to transform the land, to grow crops, to make it sustainable for the expansion of a European population that's uh, beginning to grow uh, after the dark ages or after uh, the death ages, right? In which so many people died as a result of, 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 of the plague. So, so it's very much so tied uh, to, 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 to Europe's uh, violent acquisition of the Americas. Uh, and, and we see the more that Europe conquers in the Americas and the less successful they are uh, at getting uh, the indigenous people of the Americas uh, to uh, do their labor, uh, to be subjugated to their will, uh, the more uh, uh, we have the expansion of the of the Atlantic slave trade. Uh, whether it's um, you know pushing wars that uh, that create more prisoners of war, whether it's direct kidnapping, whether it's the uh, dismantling and destruction of African empires for the purposes of acquiring slaves. And on the topic of African slavery, the differences between African slavery and European slavery, often it is kind of charged at Africans during the period where Europeans began to import slaves from Africa uh, to the United States, to uh, South, South America, that they participated equally in the exploitation of their own people by selling and kind of profiteering in the trade of African slaves. Could you kind of explain the reasoning behind for many African leaders, uh, we can see Dahomey for, for other African states, why they chose to participate in the slave trade despite how harmful it was to African development in the long run? Yeah, so that's a, that's another really good question. And as you've noted already, it's a, it's a hotly uh, debated and contested question. I had students in, in my other class uh, this year actually ask me about it as well. And I think there, there are a couple of things to keep in mind. The first thing to keep in mind, and I think we cannot sort of escape this, and this is a part of what I think Walter Rodney is getting at uh, in this first section on how Europe underdeveloped Africa, is he's saying it is Europeans, the Portuguese initially, and then the Dutch, who show up on the west coast of Africa looking to trade with Africans, looking for spices, for textiles, and also looking for, for slaves. Mm -hmm. And as they discover and acquire more territory in the Americas, the demand for slave labor increases dramatically. And there are many instances in which Africans either resist this demand or in which Africans are overpowered. We discussed earlier the various types of political organization. Mm -hmm. We have, as we talked about, the kingdoms. You take, for example, the kingdom of the Congo that we discussed. The king of the Congo was in some way able to protect aspects of itself from Portuguese encroachment. Mm -hmm. But it wasn't successful. As a part of the Portuguese demand for slave labor, the Portuguese funded opposition against the king of the kingdom of the Congo, eventually leading to the dismantling of the kingdom of the Congo. Mm 
So what happens in this void when a formerly strong centralized territory like the kingdom of the Congo is dismantled, the king is overpowered, all of these people now become available for slave labor. And so this was a consistent dynamic on the African continent that African polities were sort of systematically destroyed, right, to facilitate the slave trade. On the other hand, as we discussed, we had a number of much smaller forms of political organizations. Those were not always thinking about the possibility of being conquered. They weren't always thinking about expansion in the same way. And so many of those territories were taken by surprise, right, when various uh, slave catchers or slave raiders uh, encroached upon them. And, 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 and sort of the last dynamic that we have are the societies that are watching this happen. And basically their options are be dismantled or get caught up into the slave trade. And so a few of them, like the homie, for example, sort of choose to reorganize around the slave trade. Mm-hmm. And and I think that you know that that there there is there is a major question as as to why, but I think one of the things that we know for sure is that one of the disruptive aspects of the slave trade is that it moved the primary economic activity within the African continent from inside of it to the coast. And it gave and allowed new opportunities for people who wanted to take advantage of this of this trade to do so. But as a part of that, it also represented in many ways the dismantling and the destruction of a lot of how Africa was organically uh, politically uh, developing. And so I think that's a major part of the story, Um, you know, in terms of. Of, of 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 why some people participated in it. I think in the same way people participate in evil today because of greed, because of the spoils. But also I think another big part of the story is that uh, it became one of the primary economic dynamics on 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 the continent. And 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 the part of this story has to include all of the ways that many Africans from kings to ordinary people resisted. This is why I share the story of King Alfonso I of the Congo, but he's not the only story. We have the story of Kimpa Vita, also from the Congo in the 17th century, a young princess, nobility, who 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 who, who argues uh, on theological grounds that 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 Jesus can't be Portuguese because the Portuguese are participating in the slave trade. And so instead she says, Jesus has to be born in the Mbanga Con- Congo and Jesus has to be black. And the Portuguese burn her and her boyfriend at the stake. We have uh, the story of Queen Nzinga of the Ndongo people, right? This this woman who inherits the kingdom and tries to, to stop the Portuguese from encroaching on her territory and taking, and taking over. So we have these stories of these royalties Mm-hmm. Who, who, are, who are pushing back. And we have the stories of these ordinary Africans who are pushing back. My favorite imagery to, to sort of think about Aisha is if you ever go to a slave castle and you look, the cannons are directed both towards the ocean and towards the inland. Mm-hmm. And a question, we know why it's directed to the ocean, towards other Europeans, but why are the cannons directed to the inland? The cannons are in part directed directed to the inland because you have within the continent of Africa, Africans terrorizing the slave castles, trying to go back and get their people. Mm-hmm. And so it's not just sort of a monolithic story that once the Europeans show up, Africans just sort of lay down their weapons, you know, but it said many Africans resisted, but some of them, many of them resisted unsuccessfully. Um, uh, and because of both the rate of European development and 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 the perspective that that Europe had at the time of the slave trade, I think it certainly surprised many Africans living in the various polities that they did. And I'm glad that you brought up specifically the the question of religion as it pertains to the slave trade, because I wanted to ask you kind of your thoughts on how in the present day we can reconcile the religiosity 
of European powers, especially in conjunction with the Catholic Church and democratic values, or, or Christianity in general, democratic values that were espoused in uh, places like France um, during the same time that European powers were enslaving Africans by the tens of thousands. I wonder if you have any kind of insights into the different ways in which perhaps religion served as a tool for cultural domination uh, during the slave trade. Well, this is this is one of this is one of one of the key issues. Um, you know, I mean, even even before we have the physical arrival of Europeans on the continent of Africa, what we have is these European powers getting permission from the Pope in the 15th century to dominate the world. This is what we call the doctrine of discovery. Spain and Portugal go to the Pope. And remember, the Catholic Church during the European Middle Ages, this is the Renaissance for Africa and the Islamic world, but during the European Middle Ages, the church served as the primary uniter of Western Europe, right? In the fall of the Roman Empire. So Portugal and Spain go to the church and the church, the Pope, the Pope, Pope Nicholas V gives them permission through the doctrine of discovery, through dumb diversa, uh, 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 um, um, to, to invade, to capture, to search out, to vanquish all enemies of Christ. And they begin to define the world on religious grounds. And in fact, the initial interaction with Africans and the indigenous people of the Americas is in part because Europeans are conceiving them as non-Christian and thus non-human. Mm -hmm. To really understand this though, we have to go back to the Crusades because the Crusades really helped to shape Europe's interaction with the rest of the world, especially the interaction with the Muslims. Uh, and so in many ways we can view sort of the age of discovery as an expansion of the Crusades. If we think back to Christopher Columbus, when he, when he arrives in North America, his ships, the Nina, the Pinta, and the Santa Maria, are carrying the cross of the crusade. It's the red cross of the crusades that's on his ship. So in many ways, Columbus's expansion from Spain can be understood as a part of the crusades. I say all this to say that in terms of understanding Europe, and the role that religion was playing in Europe in facilitating the Atlantic slave trade. This was key because religion helped to define non-Christians as non-humans. And it provided, as one scholar, like Professor Willie Jennings from Yale Divinity School, says provided sacred theological canopy to the enterprise of enslavement. It's, it gave it the moral justification. Can you do this? Yes, you can do this to non-Christians. And, and this continued in many ways uh, throughout the Atlantic slave trade. And of course, there are some people who resisted on religious grounds, but the overwhelming story is those people who found ways to capitulate religious ideas uh, towards enslavement. And further on the topic of the cultural aspects of European domination in Africa, let's move a little bit into the colonial period. How did Europeans at the most basic level convince the native African populations to do their bidding in propping up these colonial systems? Yeah, well, well, that's a, that's a really good, good question. You know, it's, it's it's a difficult question because, you know, it wasn't, in my view, a convincing so much as it was a conquest, right? And I think this is what this is what Walter Rodney is getting at. What he's trying to say is that Europe developed differently from Africa because it developed in part because of, of its control of the Atlantic slave trade, which gave it a type of material wealth that was new and that helped to give rise to a sort of a technological wealth and that, that technology was used to further conquest Africa. And that technological 
wealth that was used to conquer Africa was paired with a type of imperial mindset, a conquest mindset that was not necessarily the same. And so in terms of, 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 the, of the eventual, you know, colonialism that would come on the African continent, it came as a result of conquest, meaning that there were Africans that, that, that pushed back and resisted. I'm thinking about uh, Shaka Zulu. I'm thinking about uh, the Ashanti Wars in the 19th century. I'm thinking about the various jihads across West Africa, um, including uh, Samari Torre's response in the late 19th century. So I'm thinking about those. But also, um, one of the, the, the results of the conquest of the domination is that in the places that 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 Europe had the technological and really military advantage is that they placed a new set of rules. And I'm thinking about two examples. One is in the late 19th century, um, the Ashanti people in modern day Ghana had consistently fought against uh, the British uh, encroachment into the Ashanti kingdom. And eventually they win. And the British governor at the time sits on the Ashanti stool. And the idea, even by the Ashanti people, was that even the king of the Ashanti people could not sit on the stool. And here we have a British governor sitting on this stool as a sign of saying, your cultural symbols which were tied to their political symbols, which was which was tied to their epistemological symbols, have no value to me. Mm -hmm. This is important because we have to understand that African languages, African ideas are tied to African cosmology, to how Africans view the world. We view the world as sacred. We view the world as interconnected. We view the world as having balance. And so when we have a figure like the British governor sitting on the Ashanti stool, it's already beginning the process of culturally destroying many aspects of our African values. Um, and so I really see uh, the emergence of European languages, uh, and not just European languages, but European cultural systems, including the religious systems, as an emergence of of this of this type of domination and conquest. And I think, and once the domination came, I think uh, you know there were those who resisted and there were those who acquiesced. Um, but I certainly think uh, that we should primarily see it as as a conquest, including a struggle. Um, uh, and a struggle that I think continued throughout the period of colonization and even in some ways continues today. And now that we've discussed a little bit on the cultural side, let's turn to the economic side and kind of discuss a little, what would you have to say to people who say, for example, that colonialism was actually detrimental to the French economies to the British economies, that European powers put more into Africa and got less out. Like for example, my former president, <laughs> Leopold Sédar Senghor, who made the comment that the balance sheet of colonialism was positive for Africans. Yeah, well, uh, Walter, I like Walter Rodney's response to this. Walter Rodney says that the only good thing about colonialism is that it ended. Um, and I think in some ways that was a direct refutation of what Senghor uh, had said. You know, I think um, the historical record uh, proves otherwise, that uh, the that colonialism um, was primarily economic. Uh, and it gave a great economic advantage to to Europe. It's Walter Rodney's point, and this is a part of why I think this work is so important, uh, is that Europe developed in the way that it developed because of the colonies, because of African gold, African ivory, African spices, African rubber. Uh, 
uh, African uh, palm oil, um, African cocoa, African coffee, um, that it was able to acquire with these territories, the raw materials uh, to then send them back to Europe to be manufactured and sold all across the world and set the terms for the new world economy. And so I think uh, that the balance sheet of colonialism was not positive for Africa. It was ultimately detrimental and destructive uh, and that, you know, Europe benefited uh, and benefited even feels like not even the strong enough of a word, uh, but, but, but Europe's wealth cannot be understood without uh, uh, making sense of the exploitation and the destruction of Africa as a result of both the Atlantic slave trade and European uh, colonialism. Yeah, and Rodney talks a little bit about how pre-colonial trade kind of started that disintegration of African economies um, and their technological impoverishment. Uh, and he says that colonial rule speeded up that trend. So he gives the example of somebody trying to make a telephone call from Accra uh, in the British colony of the Gold Coast to Abidjan in the French colony of the Ivory Coast. And he says that first you had to be connected to an operator in London and then an operator in Paris who could offer lines to a Bijan. And if we're looking at the connection between African countries today, looking towards the present, could you speak a little bit about how colonialism started the kind of disintegration of intra-African trade, intra-African political connections yeah, no, that's that's a very it's a very profound point that you raise and that 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 Rodney raises. I mean, I'll, 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 I will give an anecdote. So so earlier this week, I was I was on the continent of Africa, and 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 prior to this trip, my plan was to go from from South Africa to uh, to Ghana and to and to Nigeria. And initially, looking at at flights, there was one one flight every three days that would go from South Africa to uh, Nigeria uh, directly, South African air. But in some instances, to get from South Africa to Nigeria, British Airways wanted me to fly from South Africa to London, and then from London back to Nigeria. Mm -hmm. yeah. This sort of travel across the African continent is very difficult when you have, as you, it's a very good example, you know, the proximity of Abidjan and Accra, they're, they're for all intents and purposes neighbors. But what colonialism did is that it positioned Accra within the sphere of England and Abidjan within the sphere of France. Meaning that if someone wanted to connect, as you noted, between Accra and Abidjan, that they had to go through Europe. And so it sort of repositions Africa's relationship to itself. And, and I think in terms of, of, of trade, it does that. I think in terms of language, it does that. But, but, but a part of the difficulty is, and I think this example of, of Ghana and Cote d'Ivoire is very interesting. You know, people on the eastern border of Cote d'Ivoire and the western border of Ghana are not terribly different people. Mm -hmm. In fact, many of them are part of the same ethnic groups, the same nations. And so, so one of the one of the ironies of the colonial system is that is that it disrupted groups of people that historically were together. Yeah. And and in some ways we're still reeling from that disruption. And to go for even further kind of on the present day implications of this kind of disintegration of uh, relationships between African countries, would you say that, for example, the reason today that many economists say that one of the problems uh, about African countries is that no particular country has a uh, market large enough for its goods and services. Like there isn't a 
overwhelming like African Union the way that there's a European Union and there's a kind of struggle in establishing intra-African trade and most of Africa's trade goes outwards is with relationships with Europe, with relationships with Asia. Do you think that this kind of orientation of trade outwards or perhaps surplus outwards is a reflection of the colonial system? Yeah. So, I mean, I will say, first of all, I probably I probably start by rejecting a lot of how Western economists sort of frame the situation in Africa. Right. You know, and and I and I do so because I don't you know, I I think that 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 that, you know, say say it's like uh, say it's like you walk up to a house that's been hit by a tornado and you start the story by saying, wow. What did the, I can't believe these people have not cleaned up the house. Right. But the tornado just hit. As opposed to telling the story of, oh, a tornado hit this house. Yeah. And I think in some ways, colonialism is, and maybe the, the example isn't quite one-to-one, but it's an example of a tornado hitting the house of Africa. And in some ways we start the economic discussions after the tornado is hit and don't deal at all with the fact that the tornado has hit the African continent. And yeah. so so in in terms of of issues of trade and development and even markets, I think that 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 what do we have? Africa is as far as a continent is concerned is the youngest continent in the world. The population continues to to grow rapidly. So all of these factors, I think, are there for very strong markets and trade. Mm-hmm. The issue, though, is that Africans in the colonial era and even at times today have been barred from participating fully in the global economy. They've been barred from 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 from, from fully uh, maximizing their economic potential. And this is this is what Walter Rodney is trying to account for. And he's saying that 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 barring, whether it comes from France or from England or from the United States or from multinational corporations, that barring really accounts for the lack of economic development in Africa more than anything else. I think if 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 those restrictions were pulled away, uh, we would see Africans developing uh, the types of of networks needed to um rapidly industrialize uh and 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 rapidly uh compete and something else that walter rodney talks about um just briefly is what he considers to be the collusion of african politicians with european powers to maintain even past the colonial period, if we want to say that into perhaps the neo-colonial sure. period, to maintain Europe's kind of grip on Africa. He says particularly, which I find kind of amusing, that wherever you see African underdevelopment, there are men in Kinshasa, I think mm. he says in Dakar, in Abidja, who dance when music is played in London, in Paris, and in New York. Could you give us a few examples of African politicians who you feel like have participated in this kind of collusion? Could be historical or present day. Present, yeah. Well, one, one, it, it just represents one of those uh, brilliant lines of prose that's in the book, right? I think that that if you like good reading, this is why this is such a a good, relevant book uh, because Walter Rodney writes so well really evocatively uh and provocatively as as well but but you know i think i think the classic historical example of this is uh, mobutu in the congo so so when congo becomes independent uh P- patrice lumumba leads the independence of the congo and within a year of lumumba as the prime minister uh, he's assassinated by a a us un and belgian um, coup that there are many, many good, good, good records about, including the assassination of Patrice Lumumba. 
Lumba uh, by uh, Ludo uh, DeWitt. Uh, it's a really, really good book about this. Um, but one of the things that that happens is that Lumumba is replaced by uh, Mobutu. And for 30 years, Mobutu um, leads Congo. And all of this money is poured in from the United States and from Belgium. Um, and it really helps to facilitate uh, what is going on in the Congo today that many people are talking about. I'm fascinated, you know, when I read social media to see all these people saying, oh, did you know that there was a genocide in the Congo? There's been, there, there, there's been this massive situation of violence happening in the Congo since independence, in part because a figure like Mobutu was used after the removal of Le Cru uh, of, after the removal of Lumumba to ensure that the raw materials of the Congo continue to be available to the Western world. Mm -hmm. And to me, this represents one of one of one of one of one of the key areas of 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 of, of this. And I think even when we look to West Africa uh right now, I think this is a part of the point of the the response that has taken place in Burkina Faso, in Niger, in Mali, that within the past year, there have been coups to kick out the French puppets out of these places, right? To say that these people are saying, look, we don't want to dance to tunes in Europe anymore. And it's a it's a, and it's a very big big question as to as as to what will happen what will what will what, what will be a result of this um, um but right now uh, I think uh, uh, there are a number of people's movements that recognize this lineage from the colonial era and and have tried to to respond to it. Mm -hmm. And as we wind down the conversation, if you could just give kind of your opinion on the ways in which neocolonialism has manifested extremely modern day, like maybe the last five to 10 years on the African continent, how much influence do you think that the French government under Macron, for example, has under previous uh, Francophone colonies or the United States, perhaps in maybe even uh, Liberia? I, I did want to ask you, uh, and perhaps I'll, I'll save it for the second half of the question, but I did want to ask you, Walter Rodney points out uh, that for all intensive purposes, he feels like Liberia was a colony of the United States. And we don't yeah. hear a lot about American colonialism in Africa because allegedly it didn't happen. <laughs> allegedly, it, it was a different time period. And so if you could just talk about the first part of the question being modern day's examples of neocolonialism, perhaps military, economic, even social, and the second part of the question being, you know, to, to, to Walter Rodney's point, in what ways did the United States play a role in African underdevelopment? Because it's called how Europe underdeveloped Africa. You know, the U.S. is kind of like glad because we're not being mentioned. <laughs> yeah. No, it's a, it's a, I mean, it's a great question because they, 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 they really go together. So, so I think one of the things that happened after colonialism formally ended um, is that neo-colonialism neo emerged. And I think the primary characteristic of neo-colonialism was a type of economic imperialism uh, and a type of, of military intervention. And I think in many ways, uh, we can under, if we understand the period of the 1960s through the 1990s of as a period of conflict in Africa, I think it's tied to these neo-colonial impulses. Uh, and there are a number of really good works uh, about this, including, I'm thinking about Elizabeth Smith's work, uh, Foreign Intervention in Africa, um, um, as, a, as a good example of, of, of this that really talks throughout the continent. But, but I think that, that, you know, in terms of today, uh, how does neo-colonialism function in Africa? Um, I mean, there is resistance in the former French colonies, but the CFA franc, as in the primary currency across former French West Africa, uh, is in French banks, mm -hmm. meaning that sometimes the governments of Gabon, um, uh, of Cote d'Ivoire, of Senegal, have to go to France to get their money. 
you would control me, Aisha, if you had all of my money, if I had to ask for your permission to spend it. Mm -hmm. And so I think uh, those economic examples, I think that in some ways, uh, some of the regional organizations are examples of this. If we look even at ECOWAS, there's a major question because after the coup in Burkina Faso, uh, ECOWAS, under, I think, pressure from France and the United States, wanted Nigeria to invade Niger and Burkina Faso. Fortunately, the Nigerian uh, parliament said no. But think about this major crisis that Nigeria should invade their neighbors because of the regime change. Mm -hmm. And the Nigerian president felt as though he needed to sort of do that. And so, so I think um, that uh, one of the, the, the primary dynamics is because of the, of the, of the global economic system, um, colonialism has ended, but I don't think many African states are sovereign. I think it is a question as to which African states are sovereign. And I think there are some that are struggling to maintain their sovereignty. And I think it leads very neatly into your second question about the United States. I think that 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 we really see the the United States advancing in this post-colonial era. We have to we have to keep in mind that while the United States is a major world prior world power power prior to uh, the Second World War, it becomes the world superpower after the Second World War, and and the new terms of of neo-colonialism, which is economic imperialism, really allow for the United States to flourish. One of the few things that I disagree with Rodney and how Europe underdeveloped Africa is I think he isn't nuanced enough about Liberia's story. Mm -hmm. So he says that Liberia was a US colony uh, virtually the, the whole time. I don't actually see it that way. I think that Liberia becomes a US colony after the Second World War. Mm -hmm. That it's through the emergence of American companies that the U.S. can then exert more power on Liberia. I think in the late 19th and early 20th century, Liberia was sovereign. But I think the story of Liberia is a story of a country that that loses its sovereignty throughout the 20th century, um, uh, as opposed to as opposed to a country that sort of never had it. And so I think the way that the United States participates in colonialism um, is through its economic and political and military relationships. I mean, we have to think about AFRICOM, right? And all of the military bases that the U.S. is establishing across the African continent. It's not it's not for the security of Africans. I'll tell you, I'll tell you that much. You know, something to keep in mind as we as we wrap up, you know, the U.S. was at the, the Berlin conference. The U.S. had representatives at the Berlin Conference, and we don't tell that story often enough. And so the, year, the U.S. has been in, interested, but their style has been a little bit different from the style of the British and, and the French. And, and so now we really see uh, a sort of a soft American presence, um, but the soft American presence is uh, is not necessarily uh, a presence that 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 isn't uh, neo uh, colonial. It just sort of looks looks differently. Yeah, and ironically enough, especially just topically with the death of Henry Kissinger happening uh, last week, you can see that Americans have been very hands on uh, in recent years in Africa, whether it's in civil wars in Angola, Mozambique, whether it's been in you know supporting apartheid in South Africa <laughs> during the 1960s, and also with economic institutions like the IMF and the World Bank. But perhaps I'll just pose to you uh, as a final kind of inquiry, the question of African independence and of African liberation. Could you talk a little bit about the conditions that allowed African colonies to break free and to become independent? Was it really just, you know, for example, Charles de Gaulle coming and giving these mm -hmm. African people in a kind of paternal way their independence? Or was it more of a, a fight, perhaps, for liberation? I think it's a really great question. I think it was a convergence of forces. Um, I think that, um, African resistance started the moment Europeans arrived on the African continent in the 1400s. And African resistance continued throughout the slave trade and throughout the era of colonization. But I think in the middle of the 20th century, when Europe went to war 
or against itself, it opened up a new opportunity for many Africans to see both the vulnerability of Europe uh, and to organize themselves across regional, continental, and even oceanic lines. Uh, and I think that presented an opportunity and an opening uh, for Africans to organize Pan-African conferences, to, to, to discuss uh, the shared predicament of African people in West Africa, in East Africa, in Southern Africa, in the African diaspora, in Martinique, in Jamaica. Um, and I think uh, they were able to take advantage of the vulnerability of Europe um, during, during that time as a way of, of striking for their freedom. Um, and I think that that there were some 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 keen strategists and thinkers who recognized the tide change that was coming, like the Gaul, and tried to take advantage of that. And there were those who resisted, and there were prolonged and protracted struggles for freedom in Angola, in South Africa, in Kenya, in Algeria, um, and 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 so these plurality of forces um, led, uh, you know, ultimately to the first wave of African independence, but I think it's still in process. Um, and I guess I just wanted to end on a positive note and kind of your thoughts, maybe just a little uh, condensed view of the future of Africa, what you would say to the current generations who perhaps are feeling a bit, there, there, there might be an atmosphere of, of nihilism a little amongst uh, the, the African youth in the sense that, you know, things have been the same, relatively the same for many Africans who, mm. uh, you know, grew up after the colonial period where they're dealing with, you know, civil strife, they're dealing with uh, no economic opportunity, no jobs, having to go to Europe, having to go to the United States to be able to find a future but perhaps if you could say a few words on what you feel like the youth or just Africans have a responsibility to do to kind of finally realize this potential that Rodney is saying was stolen from them by European powers. It's a it's a really great question, you know, and I and it's something that I think about all the time as an African, as someone who considers myself to be an African youth, I don't know if you consider me that or not. Of <laughs> um, uh, and as someone who 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 teaches African history uh, from the perspective of Africans, which is a key aspect, right? I want to know as best as we can what do we think about our own stories. Um, and I think as as someone who 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 sort of thinks about this, you know, I think about it this way that that you know. Imagine you're lost in the woods and you discover a map that tells you how you got lost. It doesn't tell you how to get out of the woods, but it helps you understand how you got into what you got into. I think that map would be hopeful. And I think in many ways, that's what African history offers. It, it says to, to Africans and the allies of Africans and those interested in the well-being of Africans, this is the story of how we got here. And I think this story of how we got here can inspire us to make decisions about how do we, how do we move forward? How do we respond? Um, and... To me, the beautiful thing about studying African history is that while there are so many stories of suffering, of conquest, of domination, of violence, um, there are also stories of, of struggle, of a vision, of, of, of persistence. Um, and, 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 you know, to me, uh, I think about, I think about uh, my favorite books in the American context. Um, and it's by ta Coates from Between the World and Me. And he writes in Between the World and Me, you know, I named you Samari 
after Samari Torre. And he says, uh, and Samari means to struggle. And the struggle in and of itself is worth it. And I think that that's where my hope comes from is that, is that, is that I don't believe that history is predetermined. I don't believe that the story is already written. I think that those of us who read, those of us who write, those of us who study, those of us who make music, those of us who make art, those of us who live our lives as human beings, I think that we too sort of get to shape the story. And, and I think our shaping of the story is a part of that struggle. And it's not predetermined what the outcome will be. And so my own hope is that we can use the study of African history, the careful study uh, of African history from the perspective of Africans, um, you know, to continue to free ourselves out of this dynamic, out of these woods, out of this paradigm. Um, and, and I think uh, within our African cosmology and our African culture and our African epistemology, we have resources available to us uh, because for as far encompassing as colonialism and European domination was, it was never total and can never be total um, because Africans have continued to retain their humanity in the midst of the great suffering. Uh, and, and we have, and what African, off, what African history offers us is a repository of those who resisted in a plurality of ways uh, the attempts of enslavement. Yeah, that's brilliant. Thank you so much. I really appreciate you taking the time to come and have this conversation. And I think that the points that you make are extremely valuable. And I think that it's so important that more and more, not just Africans, but people uh, of, of the glo of globally, can see the ways in which our history has perhaps been obscured uh, by people who had a vested interest in maintaining a kind of skewed uh, version of history because it's absolutely true that if you have this kind of deterministic view, which some historians do, that Africa was meant to be conquered and that that would be uh, kind of its, uh, its destiny, then that does pose the question as to what is its future. <laughs> right. I just want to thank you so much for taking the time to talk with me. I know you're very busy and I always enjoy our, our conversations. <laughs> well, this is, this is very rich for me too. Thank you for uh, taking the opportunity to, to have this conversation with me for me to talk about my favorite book. Uh, uh, and, and of course, to talk about my favorite subject, which is um, African history. Yeah. And is there anything, you know, are, are you writing a book, anything that you can promote, you know, about yourself, your Twitter, your, you know, <laughs> any kind of. Um, yeah, yeah. So I'm working, I'm working on, uh, on a book right now uh, entitled uh, The Invisible Hands of War, uh, mm -hmm. The Existence of Conflict in Liberia, mm -hmm. uh, White Supremacy and Black Sovereignty. And I'm making some of the arguments that I've made to you about uh, sovereignty uh, being lost over time in Liberia and using Liberia as actually a case study to understand, um, you know, the process by which Africa became subjugated to your uh, domination and the resistance to it. And so uh, looking for a publisher right now and and hopefully uh, we'll have it out in the next uh, year or two. So uh, stay tuned. Uh, That's for that. awesome. Yeah, we'll put that in the description and send people your way. So thank you so much for having this conversation and uh, I hope you have a great rest of your day. Thanks, you too.